What's up, everybody, and welcome back to TarHillIllustrated.com. Or, of course, if you're watching on our growing YouTube channel, that is Tar Heel Illustrated. I'm THI staff writer Jacob Turner, and joining me, as he always does, our very own publisher, Andrew Jones. And Andrew, Carolina's first game of the season against Virginia Tech is fast approaching. We've done a video on the offense, kind of talking about what our expectations are for North Carolina's offense this season. Now we're moving over to the other side of the ball and touching on Carolina's defense. And I think there's one word in particular that kind of stands out for me, and I think you'll agree with this as well, um, depth. Mm -hmm. I think this is a defensive unit that has a ton of depth um, in, 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 in multiple positions, kind of all across the board, and some more in particular when you look at some of the more experienced guys that are behind them in some of these position groups. And kind of leads me to where I want to start out with. I want to start out with the secondary, that cornerback and, that, and those safeties and nickel position, everything like that. I think this is a, a group, a secondary group that really represents the depth that Carolina has. I think that's probably Carolina's strongest depth on the defensive side of the ball when you look at some of the younger guys on the defensive line and, and some of the younger guys at the linebacker positions as well who are talented for sure, but behind the starters just haven't played a ton of re, uh, snaps yet. But looking at the secondary, specifically at the cornerback position, Kyler McMichael, Storm Duck, Tony Grimes, you got Storm back, Duck uh, back practicing now, which is a positive sign for this team. And then you go back to the safety um, room where you guys got, got, got guys, excuse me, like Cam Kelly, Trey Morrison, Don Chapman, just a ton of guys in that position group who have played a lot of minutes all over the board in that secondary room. So let's start with them and let's, let's kind of hit on the depth in that secondary because I think, like I said, as a whole, I think this defense has a lot of depth. But when you really hone in on those two position groups in particular, I think it becomes very evident what kind of talent is there. Well, they're loaded. And this Jacurius Conley. Safety. Yeah, um, forgot to even finished, mention him. Yeah, he's he hits like a linebacker and he can track like a safety. Mm. Probably cover like a corner. He's got he's got NFL skills, oh, NFL yeah. potential. Uh, he's really really good. He's going to be all over the field. In fact, uh, we talked to Javon Dewitt, the special teams coach, a few days ago, and he said you might see JQ back there returning punts oh, or kickoffs, rather. Excuse me, kickoffs. He took a few back when he was in high school. Uh, in Jacksonville, I believe it was. So uh, he he's someone to keep your eye on. Giovanni Biggers, yep. they have options. Mm -hmm. Remember, we were, we were having some fun here in a video we did about a week or so ago about a moniker. How about just depth and dudes? I could see yeah. Dre walking around. Depth and dudes. Just sure. dudes course, everywhere, man. He'd have to incorporate rude boys in there somewhere. But these are rude boys. And this has been a, a nickname for the group back there for a long time. But they really are. They personify it now. Because you've got guys that... They do a lot of cross training in part with this group because these guys can play multiple positions. So you have safeties who understand nickel, who understand corner. You have corners who understand nickel and understand safety and, and all the way around. Yeah. Guys that are playing nickel Chapman's playing nickel and he was a safety for two years. So you've got a lot of interchangeable guys out there, but also smart guys who know what everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've seen with this program in a short period of time is how much the coaching staff emphasized to these guys to understand what everybody else is doing. We talked to Cedric Gray, a linebacker here, about a week and a half ago, and he's moved, he's rotating between the, the, the Mike and the Will linebacker spots, and, and it's a little bit of a challenge because the Mike is the one who barked. He's sort of the quarterback out there, Jeremiah Gimmel, right? The super smart guy who's also a great athlete. But, but he's learning both, and he understands what the outside linebacker is supposed to do, and he's learned more about – how the linemen are supposed to play, you know, two technique, four technique, all that kind of stuff. These guys learn what everybody's supposed to do. And that makes them better at what they're doing. It also helps them learn to trust their, their teammates out there. When you see busted plays sometimes, a lot of times it's not because the defense is just bad. It's because maybe a guy didn't trust a teammate and tried to compensate for him. And then his dude's exposed and he ends up making the mistake on that play, trying to do too much. You don't want that from your defense. You want, 11 guys to handle 11 responsibilities on every snap. They've reached a point where they have, they're going to have 11 guys in the field that will do that, that will understand that. Then you add the fact that a lot of these guys have NFL potential, the high caliber athletes. They have three at corner, Michael, Duck, and Grimes. At the safety nickel, you're talking about um, – you're talking about Conley's a potential NFL guy. Chapman's a potential NFL guy. It'll be Trey Morrison will be in a camp. Mm -hmm. He's he's so good back there in jack of all trades. It would not surprise me if he's on an NFL roster. And there are others. So that's kind of where they are in the secondary now. And they could be very fresh. Remember, Cam Kelly was a highly touted four-star kid that went to Auburn. 
transferred because he wanted to be closer to home, had some family stuff going on. And he's a guy that's kind of in and out of the lineup. And Bateman told us a while ago that, you know, Cam Kelly's a guy that he's great in one series and not so much the next. So a lot of teams and prior Carolina teams would just live with the guy who's great at times, hoping he eventually becomes great all the time. They don't have to do that now. They have options. You could put him, play him situationally. If Kelly's great in a particular element of the defense in a certain kind of call, you put him out there and he handles that. If he's not as strong in something else, you put a guy on the field who can handle that a little Mm -hmm. bit better. You're going to see that in the secondary, and you're going to see that in the defensive line, and and maybe even a little bit with the outside linebacker situation. Mm -hmm. If it's a passing situation, Des Evans is probably going to be on the field, right? That's a good point. Well, well, there you go. If it's a run situation, absolute run, maybe Tavon Fox gets the call in a situation like that. So that's the great thing about this defense. And we've talked about it a lot. I've written about it. I've asked the coaches and players questions about it. Guys will play – some guys will play situationally. Some like Gimmel, they'll be on the field all the time. Grimes will be on the field all the time. Morrison likely on the field all the time. But a lot of them are going to play situationally. And that's when you have depth in dudes can do for you. Definitely. I mean, when you got guys like Geo Biggers and um, Don Chapman back there who can come in, Cam Kelly can come in and play minutes. I mean, that just adds so much of a different element to the secondary who – He's come a long way. Let's not forget what the 2019 season was like in particular when they had guys started going down. I remember Jay Bateman looking back there on some games, be like, I don't, don't have anybody. I don't have any other bodies to put in there. Everybody's hurt. You know what I mean? So, yeah, well, Day Day Hollins, where are you? Yeah. Exactly. Go in there. Go in there. But, but coach, go in there. And he did a solid job. Yeah, That's solid. the thing about corner. Day Day Hollins has been called on in the middle of the last two seasons. And he did an admirable job two years ago, especially when they had to do on-the-job training, essentially. And he did a really good job last year. So he's your fourth corner. I, look around the ACC. I could name you half the schools in the ACC just off the top of my head right now where Hollins would start. Oh yeah, yeah. Maybe more than that. Obi Buna would start on some teams, and he's your fifth corner. Mm-hmm. And that's before you even get to the freshmen, the true freshmen who are very, very talented. Yeah. We're not even talking. We didn't even mention Cameron Roseman Sinclair. Remember him? Yep. Four-star kid from Charlotte who was a jewel of the class for a while. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what happens when you have depth in dudes. Mm-hmm. You forget about guys sometimes that <laughs> were once ballyhooed. It wasn't long ago that this that the coaching staff, they're on their knees begging and praying that four-star kids became four-star kids. Mm-hmm. They've gotten to a point now, and I know that I've said this in a couple of other videos, but I'll say it again. People need to understand. They don't have to cling to every four-star for them to become a four-star. They can absorb some kids that don't become that. And I'm not insinuating that Cameron Rosman Sinclair isn't living up to it. He's just in his position group where there are a lot of guys. Yeah. And it's tough to get through. They can only play so many in the field at a time. I'm sure Bateman would love to put 25 dudes out there, but he can only put 11. And there's a pecking order. So that's where the defense is now, and that's where it was not a couple of years ago. Yeah, definitely a lot of improvements, and, and that's what that's what really good recruiting does for you. I mean, it just allows you to do stuff like that. Um, let's move up a little bit closer to the defensive line. I'm not going to hit on the defensive line quite yet. We'll save that for last. But let's talk about that linebacker position. Jeremiah Gimmel, quarterback on the team, a guy that we already know what he can do out on the field, you know, playing alongside Chaz Surratt for the past couple of years. Now he's going to be partnered alongside uh, Eugene Asante, who I think is going to end up being a, a really good linebacker for this team. It showed some glimpses last year, and including that Orange Bowl as well but you know jeremiah gimlin particularly is just a guy that people are just ran and raving about uh, i know mac and the coaches just absolutely love the guy jay baben absolutely loves the guy not only for what he does on the field and what kind of a leader he is on the field but what he does off of it as well so i think when you've got a guy like him who's essentially the quarterback of that defense and has just played a ton of snaps in his time in north carolina you got to be feeling pretty good about the leadership on that unit as a whole, especially when you consider just how deep this defense is, like we talked about, the word of the day in this podcast is depth. So they, they, that's got to make you feel really good about it, especially when you're trying to bring, bring a guy in like Eugene Asante to play alongside you. Because let's let's not let's not forget this. Chaz and Jeremiah played about every snap they could play the last couple of years. It didn't mean that Eugene did come in at, at time to time and started. I think he started what last year against Virginia Tech or something like that as well. Yeah, so he's, he uh, yeah he started. And it was sort of as a nickel. They were trying to figure yeah, out. Yeah, the they were trying spot. to switch it up a little bit. So he's they were playing. trying to figure some stuff out there and band aid it, and they gave him a start there. But then his only real time at the position he's playing now was in the Orange Bowl, and he had ten tackles. Exactly, and he was so, he's a sideline to sideline guy. 
so incredibly fast and a guy that, you know, from, from what I heard, I think uh, Brian has said at the strength and conditioning coach, that he's a guy out there with a purpose right now in, in the oh, yeah. weight room and on the field as well. So, I mean, just a guy that I, I really do expect to, to, to make some positive strides and be a really good linebacker for this team this year. But focus on that linebacker group still. You got those two guys. You got guys like Rara Dilworth, Power Eccles, true freshman coming in who, you know, the expectations are very high for. I keep hearing Power Eccles' name being, being tossed around as well as somebody who's really impressive, um, not only on the field, but in the weight room as well and kind of his work ethic. And then you add Cedric Gray in there too. So I think there's definitely depth at that position. Obviously, there's, you know, not a lot of – uh, proven depth are guys that have played a lot of a lot of college snaps at the linebacker position behind Gimmel and Asante. But based on what we've seen, like I mentioned earlier, from Jay Bateman and this coaching staff over the past two years, I mean, you're probably going to be expecting Gimmel and Asante to rarely come out because that's just what we have to go by based on what we've we've seen since since Max come in. But remember, one of the other uh, missions and maybe even a mantra is do more with less, do more playing mm -hmm. less, produce mm -hmm. more playing less. Yep. They don't go back to Notre Dame and Texas A&M. And we'll take Mac at his own words. Mm -hmm. They weren't as fresh as they needed to be. And they lost those games in the fourth quarter. They led A&M in the fourth quarter yep. and they were right there with Notre Dame and they, they couldn't get Notre Dame off the field and they couldn't get A&M off the field late. And it's not just because the defensive line was tired. DB is retired, linebackers retired. So I do think you'll see when the confidence level's there, and I do think confidence in the guys behind Asante and Gimmel might be a little harder for the, the trust for the for the for the coaches to for Tommy Thigpen and Jay Bateman to have might take a little bit more time. Although they may just throw those guys out there and say, okay, you know, we got to give Gimmel a rest. You've done pretty good, pretty well in practice. You've shown flashes. Let's just see what you can do, four or five snaps on tape. And what that does for their growth. But I want to say something about Jeremiah Gimmel. Mm -hmm. You know, when we we run player interviews, we get all the play, we do everything on Zoom right now still, which is unfortunate. I much prefer to be there in person because you get to know the player, you get a feel for the player a little bit better, but it is what it is. So we run the videos whenever we get the access on our YouTube channel here. And you you would think that a Jeremiah Gimmel video would just go crazy with Carolina fans, that they would just you know, salivate for the next time yeah. we talk to Jeremiah Gimmel. Cause I know I do He's a great because he, I love talking to him. I love me some Jeremiah Gimmel. And I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Admitting that he's one of the smartest, most articulate athletes I've ever, I've ever covered and, and talks about his job and his roles and everybody else is like a coach. Yeah. You guys want to learn football. Somebody posted on our board, you know, we should do more football lingo type things on the site which okay I, there's only 24 hours in a day right yeah that's a good point <laughs> just listen to jeremiah and if you're not sure what he's talking about do what i do look it up Google you it, can yeah. figure it out yourself <laughs> because that's high-end stuff and and carolina fans need to appreciate what this young man is all about the way he plays the game the way he approaches the game how he is as a leader the fact he's going to play in the nfl Mm -hmm. He's going to play for a while in the NFL. And when he finishes playing in the NFL, eight, 10 years later, he's going to be a defensive coordinator somewhere. Easy. And maybe even a head coach at some point. He's got, he checks every damn box there is to check. Mm -hmm. And Carolina fans need to appreciate this kid. You need to turn up those video numbers on it. When we run it or any other site runs it, watch Jeremiah Gimmel because you'll learn about the game and you'll appreciate what this kid's all about because I love listening to him talk and it's not just because I'm a journo it's because I love football and I like to learn and I always learn something from him he always makes me run to google stuff and I think I know the game pretty well right yeah. but but one of the neat things about football is terminology like in baseball terminology changes a lot mm -hmm. and I love and the game changes a lot so you could learn a lot uh doing the Jeremiah Gimmel thing okay now I'm off the Gimmel soapbox Love Asante, great athlete, sideline to sideline kid, super smart. He's from Northern Virginia, back in my stopping ground, so props to him. Oh. Cedric Gray, we talked about a week ago. He's a name we heard a lot in the second week of fall camp. And, and I don't think that coaches just start talking, uh, saying positives about kids when they're not validated in this class, when it's not justified. Vanderbilt kids right now are talking about how great their teammates are. So take what teammates say sometimes with a grain of salt, okay. but not coaches and not in this program. And they said some really positive things about Cedric Gray. I think Cedric Gray can get on the field and help this team if he's thrust into a situation. Raw run power or true freshman may take some time, but my gracious, their ceilings are up here. Oh yeah. So 
you can throw a guy like out there, like I said, to get a few reps on film. If they have a high ceiling, if they get beat initially or make a wrong break or a wrong read, they could, Rob Rock can make up for it with his oh, yeah. amazing athletic ability. So that's what I like about that group. If Gimmel or Asante go down, I think there might be a little bit of trouble, but I'm pretty confident that Cedric Gray would adjust quickly and be a pretty solid player before long if he was thrust into a starting role because one of those guys went down. So I'm off my Jeremiah Gimmel thing. But Carolina fans need, need to they do, embrace yeah. this kid. Mm-hmm. You got him for one more year. If he was a basketball player, they would love him to the end. Right? Oh, man. So, so they need to appreciate what this kid does for the football program and that you got one more year of him. Yeah, definitely. I, I think Chaz might have stole some of the limelight away from Jeremiah over the past couple of years just because of his story and everything. But, yeah, make no mistakes about it. One of the best interviews on the team one of the most articulate kids on the team and a guy that can just sit there and talk X's and O's to you all day long. And for a guy like me who didn't grow up playing football, when I'm transcribing, man, you talk about doing some Googling. I've done some Googling in my day trying to figure out what the heck he's talking about sometimes. <laughs> I played, but I didn't play linebacker. I played yeah, linebacker you know, in practice one time. I was like, nah, it's not for me. Yeah, not for me. I go on a lot. It's, it's, uh, it's, he's a fantastic interview, though, and I think a, a guy that will – get a little bit more attention and a little bit more respect, not only from kind of the national media and the ACC media and whatnot, but from Carolina fans in particular, as we dive a little bit. Yeah, I'll tell you what, they're going to play a lot of national games this year. And when oh, the yeah. media and when the people who are calling the game come in a day in advance and, and they, they want to talk to a couple of players, they're all going to talk to Sam, but the first guy they talk to on defense is going to be Jeremiah. Easily, easily. You're talking about the, the quarterback on that side of the ball and just a guy that's super, super important for what they're trying to do. As a whole, let's talk about the last position group real quick, AJ, before we wrap this well, one up. Real quickly, let's hit oh, on outside ahead. linebacker. Yep. Outside linebacker, which is the hybrid position. It's yep. the – we all have fun with Jay Bateman. Okay, what do you really call Yeah, still trying to figure linebacker. that one out. It's been two years. You know, some guys have more DE skills than OLB skills. Some guys are learning to do both. It's a really big group of OLBs, mm-hmm. and I love the depth there, Jacob. Mm-hmm. I love the fact that, you know, you've got Tamon Fox, who's played 2,517 snaps, and he's back again. And then you've got Des Evans, who played like 165 or 70 snaps or whatever it was a year ago. And every snap on film was a big time lesson for him. Oh, yeah. And I think that they are going to reap the rewards of that, of those lessons and, and him getting his body bigger and learning the playbook and gaining more confidence and being a more physical player, the physicality to match that that grace he has as a, as a, as a sometimes breathtaking athlete. Oh, yeah. Uh, Cayman Rucker another super smart dude another guy who who can cover a guy who can rush a guy who's very very smart very physical plays quicker than his size plays bigger than his size when necessary you know tyron hopper's back there we haven't heard much about him at all during the really month, during this yeah. month jacob um chris collins we got to talk to him one time I, you know he's in the mix he's a guy that could certainly get to the quarterback he had three sacks i think last year so they're in good shape in that group too they're part of the linebackers, but we always kind of think of them as an isolated position yeah. because we're always thinking hybrid. Mm-hmm. See, Bateman has drilled that into us now. So yes, yeah, he, he's it's taken us a couple of years to figure out what exactly. We're, I'm sure, actually, I'm not really sure if we really know what we're supposed to call it quite yet. I think <laughs> I just call it outside linebacker, and I, I throw hybrid in there because whatever what you are. whatever you prefer, I guess. Look, at first we're trying to figure it out and watching it and say, okay, what's that guy really supposed to do? Now I love watching the position. Oh yeah, it's fun. Now we understand, like when recruiting, we're covering recruiting. We know what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. Oh, that guy, that guy's an outside linebacker hybrid, mm-hmm. and uh, you know. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is a unique little position. I always tend to group it in for some reason in my head with the defensive line, which is the next thing I want to talk about because they're, you know, well, line up in the state. But, but they've done drills. You've, you've been at practice. Exactly, yeah. I mean, with, with the first practice, Des Evans was doing a bunch of drills with defensive linemen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he said part of it was just, you know, learning some of the techniques that they use because he's going to have to rush. He's going to be in a lot of engagement. He's not just going to you know, uh, swim technique and get by alignment and get to the quarterback like no. he did all the time in high school. He needs to learn how to engage. I think that's part of him becoming a more physical player. So he spent more time with the lineman uh, this month as well, and he'd be better as a result. Oh, yeah, 100%. Let's talk about that D-line real quick before we wrap this one up. Um, I'm not going to sit here and just start railing off names, but I think when I think about the D-line, you think about most people, most Carolina fans would probably think about Ray Vahasek, Miles Murphy, kind of off the top of their head. And those are two guys that um, have been talked about a lot. And Ray Bahasek's gotten a lot of preseason love this year, which has been a little bit of a surprise to me. I thought he was good last year, and I thought he got a lot better towards the end of the year. But 
he's a guy that, you know, I think, I think Phil Steele had him as a third team preseason all American. He's got some other, all, all, I think some all ACC preseason honors as well. So expectations have definitely ramped up on what he can do. And if he can meet that, these, this defensive line is going to be so much better. Miles Murphy, a guy that was kind of thrown in throughout the middle of the season improved as the year went on as well. And as a guy that people have high expectations with and, even behind that, I mean, I think you've just got a ton of guys that can make an impact. I mean, Kedrick Bingley Jones, we haven't seen quite yet a guy that, you know, was just getting ran and rave about um, before he got injured um, during his true freshman season. And, and then you've got guys behind him that are true freshmen this year, Keyshawn Silver, uh, Javar Ritzy in particular. I think expectations are high for as well at some point. And, and I know I'm missing some names in there as well because there's just a lot of bodies down there. But ten, yeah, ten guys. I know, right? <laughs> I'm trying to remember all those names. I need a list over here. But – you look at that defensive line. We've talked a lot about this defensive line going back to the spring again is, is a group that we might have the biggest question mark about. I don't know if that's changed for you throughout fall camp at all based on what you've kind of heard and seen from the players and the coaches. But overall, what are your kind of thoughts on the, the high end for the, this, this defensive line and, and what kind of unit they can be on a consistent basis? Well, it, I will get to all that. Uh, I think it's interesting about the Hasek where – Mm -hmm. Again, look at our video. We didn't do interviews with Javar or Keyshawn yet. They're not, they won't give us give them to us until they played an actual game. But I would imagine if we ran interviews with them, they would have gotten a lot of hits. Oh, yeah. Uh, and Vahasi didn't get a lot. And no, he's, he's one the of those guys. American, and he's just everyone just loves the, the, the new guy, the new thing. And mm -hmm. I asked Mac a question the other day about backup quarterback. He's like, everybody loves the backup quarterback. Yeah. You know, he's the most popular guy, and people talk about him. Okay. Well, it, in the defensive line, there's so many guys. People want to talk about um, the ones who came in with that are more highly decorated. So that mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. But Vahasic, when you talk to the other dudes, they talk, and, and even some of the coaches, and we had Tim Cross last week, the defensive line coach. But Hasek's sort of a trendsetter. He, he sets the standard up there. Mm. He sets the standard in preparation. He sets the standard in how hard you work. He sets the standard in all that stuff in drills. Every drill is the most important. Every drill rep is the most important rep he's ever taken. Mm. And it's really important to note that because you have young guys, a lot of young guys, they're trying to bring those guys along quickly. Like, you know, they, when they get Javari Ritzy and Keyshawn Silver, the Virginia Tech game, they want to see growth quickly. You know, Miles Murphy, they gave him a few reps here and there last year, and it was it was the late in the Wake, uh, Wake Forest game when he really started to grow. He showed flashes, but he started to become a more consistent player. They want these guys to become that consistent player as quickly as possible. So I think that having a guy like Vahasic every day in fall camp and throughout August, and certainly even in the player-led practices before they got to fall camp, showing those guys the way is huge. And so his value isn't just as a highly efficient uh, defensive lineman, uh, nose guard, whatever it is he's playing. Uh, he grades out well. He does a lot of things well. He's a 35 to 40 snap a game guy, maybe more this year because he's stronger than he's ever been before. So I think people need to understand that about him. Miles Murphy's got you know all ACC potential. Oh, he's yeah. a guy that blew up last year like I was talking about. He's someone that can make plays. And think about if you're a diehard Carolina football fan, you remember last season, well, you can picture in your mind right now because some of those times when, oh, my gosh, Murphy's in the backfield. Mm -hmm. We did it, sitting up in the press box. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh, we got played by Miles Murphy. And that's before he learned how to squat properly. Yeah, that's, that's Okay. Right. Brian has like, dude, let me show you how to squat properly. And he went from squatting 325 to 515. It's crazy. So you're going to see more of him in the backfield. Mm -hmm. You're going to see him control the offensive lineman and read and react and, and do all those things better this year because of that lower body strength. But I love the guys that they have there. I think Tamari Fox, because he missed the spring and we haven't written a ton about him, I think he's a guy that's become trusted and reliable. He's going to give them a lot of reps. We keep hearing Jaleel Taylor. Everyone that I talk to, you know, when they reach out and ask me questions and the topic of the defensive line comes up, people are like, oh, when's Jaleel Taylor going to transfer? He must be the 10th guy. He's still there. And mm -hmm. guys keep talking about him. And he's going to be in the rotation. So expect to see him on the field. So I'll tell you the two that we're get, we're hearing a lot about now, and we actually had one of them last week, was Kevin Hester. Mm -hmm. He played one year of high school football. He was a basketball player. But he was sort of a blank canvas, which is kind of a cool thing. And they were able to bring him in, and they didn't have to break a lot of bad habits. They just had to get him into football mode, football body, football physicality, football smarts, and then be able to react as a football player. Well, by all accounts, he's there now. 
And he's a guy you're going to see on the field as well. So you're going to have a basketball player, pretty good basketball player, by the way, who's at the line of scrimmage with a hand down doing all kinds of stuff. We've heard about Christian Varner making a lot of progress. We've heard more about Hester. Um, and then, of course, you've got the, the two freshmen. You got Clyde Pinder back. Yeah, Clyde go, back to, as well. go back to another four star kid oh, no. that might be way, way down on the depth chart right now, but not because he's not doing well, but it's because they've got so many other dudes there. Mm-hmm. Dudes in depth means that four star kids are sometimes distant on the depth chart. And the program has positioned itself now where they can absorb that. They can handle that. Not all four stars go to Chapel Hill yeah. expected to start right away like they used to. Mm-hmm. so it's, defensive it's line is going to be fantastic there. Jacob mm-hmm. they're going to be better because they're going to be fresh to answer your other question mm-hmm. so I went back and I mentioned Notre Dame and Texas A&M because Mac constantly refresh, uh, references it and for good reason they'll be, they'll be fresher at safety fresher at corner they possibly fresher at middle linebacker I say possibly because we've not seen them substitute much there so if they do they'll be fresher fresher at outside linebacker and fresher along the line of scrimmage. For that reason alone, they'll be better defensively. Then you throw improvement, the mass of talent, the high-end potential a lot of these guys have. I think you're going to see a 20 to 25% improvement on the defense at least. I think you're going to see a defense that's better the first week of October than it is in Blacksburg, better the first week of November than it is in October. Mm -hmm. And if they get to December and play an important game in Charlotte in December, they're going to be even better when they walk into that game. Do you think you'll see Jay Bateman trying some different things and maybe some things he wouldn't have tried in the past just because he's got so much depth across, you know, the whole defense as a whole? I mean, you could look at it one of two ways. They're a lot better, so you could play straight up and be successful. That's a good point. I mean, if a coach never has to blitz and never has to um, you know, bring misdirection type stuff from, from where the office doesn't expect it and they could just beat you playing straight up, a base three, four defense, which is what he would like. Uh, I, I think that, um, I think that that's what he would do. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if, if your corners can cover, why, why not just let them cover? Why yeah, bring why them did, and then, yeah, and then yeah. expose the safety for maybe making a mistake and suddenly a guy's wide open. The blitz is good, but the quarterback gets rid of the ball. And next thing he has a dude wide open for 30 yards. So um, I do think you know, to answer your question, we'll see more stuff, but it'll be situational. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if he's getting a conventional rush from the line and they're getting a consistent push, he could bring guys and they're going to be harder to pick up. Because if you've got one running back and Ray Vahasek's beating his man or Murphy's beating his man or Ritzy's beating his man, the running back has to pick that up. Well, the blitz gets in and makes a play. So Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it's going to be situational. It's going to be depending on the opponent. Yeah. They're in a position now where they can actually craft unique game plans for everybody. Yeah. So, you know, they're going to do what they do. But they could go heavy in one area because they because they have the ability to one week and maybe heavy in another area because they have the ability to the next week, mm-hmm. whatever yeah. it calls for. And I think that that's why we'll see more of what Bateman uh, would prefer. He's never had this many toys to play with on defense. No. No. Didn't have him at West Point. He no. needed to. He needed a lot of that stuff at West Point to be effective. Mm-hmm. And he could use it now. But if you can go straight up eleven and have a lot of success and. Just line up and play, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, 100%. Depth and dudes is the takeaway from this pocket. We still got to get that. We need to get that trademark on a T-shirt or something, man. Make some, Depth and dudes. Make some good money off that, right? But, yeah, there's, 10, there's a – 10, 15 bucks, yeah. Yeah, easy, man. Easy little shirt. I could, I could see that being a, a Carolina favorite. I mean, there's, there's just so much depth on the defensive side of the ball. And, you know, could it could end up being one of the you know best defenses we've seen from, from Carolina in recent memory, especially because there's just a ton of, of talent all across Until the Until next year. Yeah, when they when they and reload, be even better and next year. guys. Yeah, it's yeah, hundred percent. They're not losing a lot of guys, so no, they'll just add more talent next year, and you know, not to mention bringing in you know number one player in the state, number three player in the in the country. But just the young guys will be a lot better. Exactly, you got a lot of you got a lot of talent that's going to continue to be coming on that defensive side of the ball, and you know if they can continue to win, that's they're going to have no play, problem attracting some of these big time players like they have been to the program. So yeah, it's just a great place to wrap this one up. If you guys haven't seen the offensive video we've done as well. Go check that one out after you finish this one up, of course. And hope you guys enjoyed the video we did here on the defensive side of the ball. Is, uh, depth in dudes, if you learn anything from this podcast. Yeah, and check out those Jeremiah Gimmel videos. Yeah, go watch that. Yeah, give, give him the give, He needs to become a fan favorite. He does. He does. Let's, let's, that's our campaign now. Are yeah. we allowed to do that? Is that? I think, that I think we can. Is that stepping out of line journalistically? I think we're all right. You know, it, you know it's, it. 
He's a, he's a, he's a, you talk about a great interview and great kid. I mean, you got and he needs a little bit more love. I think most people would agree with that. You know what I mean? We get to cover him on a daily basis, unlike the fans and definitely a guy that goes a little bit under the radar in terms of yeah. somebody you hear about all the time. So yeah, let, let's get Jeremiah going. Let's get a little bit more love for Jeremiah in there. Definitely go check out his videos. Jeff Jeremiah. And Jeremiah. <laughs> Show some love to those two guys. But as always, appreciate y'all watching. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, hit that notification bell as well. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks. Thanks.